Well, good evening, Beaverton. Welcome to our virtual door knocking for this evening. Tonight, it's our pleasure to have Sheriff Pat Garrett, who is running for another term uh, for Sheriff of Washington County. And my sidekick tonight back with me is Mark Spiegelberg. He's with the Barbers. Uh, he and his family own the locations in Washington County and throughout the area. Um, we are here tonight uh, because our world has changed and our candidates can't door knock and can't be convening uh, the way that uh, we have in the past and traditionally. So this is our effort to try and get the message out on the Beaverton Chambers endorsed candidates and Sheriff Garrett uh, is our, our pick for uh, continuing uh, in that capacity at Washington County. I also want to remind viewers before we get going that uh, when the Beaverton Chamber Candidate Endorsement Council comes together, we are looking at it from a business lens. We're looking for those candidates that align along our trajectory with our positions on issues like land use, transportation, safety, etc. When you sit down with your ballot, we know you wear many hats, um, but we look at it from a business perspective. And with that, I'm going to turn it over and introduce Mark to you. Thanks, Lorraine. Uh, as she mentioned, we're not only looking um, for candidates who will represent us, but also candidates who have strong leadership abilities, um, who are effective at consensus building as well. Um, with that being said, uh, Pat Garrett was our choice um, for sheriff with over 30 years at the sheriff's office. Um, we're excited to have him tonight and he can get to know him a little bit better. Um, sheriff Garrett, I hope you're doing well. Um, I know these are kind of uncharted times, uncharted territory for you. Um, how are you doing? How are you doing with everything going on? Um, tell us a little bit about the changes you've kind of had to adjust to um, with everything happening. Well, it's uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Lorraine. My thanks to the Beaverton Chamber for hosting these uh, uh, these discussions. Things are proving to be busy. So um, you, I, on March 16th, I hosted a biweekly meeting of our justice system leaders so that our presenting judge, our district attorney, our defense bar, our juvenile department, health and human services, we could coordinate the important services that we provide the community, share information, uh, make sure that um, we could continue these services in a way that balances public health and public safety. So that is uh, really helpful discussions um, and, and the courts too. The courts have instituted a level three restrictions on hearings. Uh, so they re re restricted a lot of what they're doing, though just next week, they're going to restart out of custody arraignments. And so we're working with them and our court security to be able to make that happen. So it's a lot of interim changes going on, but uh, we're getting through it. We got a, a great team and a really understanding community. Awesome. Awesome, Pat. I'll start you off with this and wanted to thank you again for your 30 years of service um, to our county. That's that's amazing. Um, wanted to start you off with this one. Uh, in your campaign, you talked about increasing the justice capacity. Can you expand on that a little bit for our viewers? Oh, gosh, I love that question. So, yes, the, the justice system that we have in, in Washington County um, the components to include like our jail and our DA's office and our juvenile department, our parole and probation officers, um, they, uh, those systems really have to be mutually supportive and have enough capacity to work effectively to support, you know, great cities like Beaverton and the Beaverton Police Department and our other communities around the county. And it just so happens today, we're out of room in the courts. We frankly don't have enough judges, but there's there's absolutely no room to grow in our courthouse. The DA's office is out of room. Parole and probation is out of room and they're spilling into interim facility space. The juvenile department's in the same place. Our jail for a county of our size who have grown, you know, our county has grown by about 10,000 residents every year for a good number of years now. That's creating a, a town or a small city every year. It's no surprise that our, our justice system has uh, really exceeded capacity to keep up with the needs of our county. So Chair Harrington has started a discussion about a strategic facilities plan. And what we need to do is really start that discussion, include our stakeholders and our cities in that discussion uh, to, really, to really study the needs that we have, not only today, but into the future for the next 20 or 30 years. And I'll give you a couple of examples about how we might not have to get bigger, but we might have to get a little different. One example is the 
kind of the profile of our adults in custody in jail are less are less adapt at following the rules at our work release center. So we have 215 beds at our transition center, our work release center, where somebody can go from jail or during a jail sentence where a judge has said, you are authorized for alternatives to incarceration. And they, they go to classes and programs at the work release center. They can go out and look for jobs or be employed, uh, be with their families during the day as a transition back to the community. There are fewer adults in custody who follow the rules there. It's harder to have folks there be successful to get returned to jail at a higher rate than only a few years ago. So we might not grow the community, the work release center, but we do need to grow uh, the jail to a degree. We had overcrowding releases last year of over a thousand, the same in 2018. But something I think we need to consider doing differently in our jail it doesn't take long to be inside and to watch the great work that our jail staff does and to realize we have too many in custody with mental health factors, right? Mental health issues. And I would love to see a triage function in our intake that for those who are suffering from some form of mental illness with maybe a charge like um, urinating in public or obstructing traffic and they're facing a discon charge, where we don't have a victim that we really need to honor or protect, that we, if we can divert them to services, working with our health department, with our DA's office, with the defense bar, and prevent them from getting into the justice system in the first place, that would be a huge win for our community. So those kinds of discussions, I think we're ready to have them. Although we have to filter this now through COVID-19, we may have some additional health screening requirements uh, uh, that we need to attend to into the future. But that's that's kind of what I mean by capacity. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, also, before I ask my next question, I just want to say thank you. Um, as you know, I facilitate the Leadership Beaverton program each year. And um, we have the privilege, and I, I mean that in the true sense of the word, of touring the Washington County Jail and seeing um, how it is set up, seeing what your amazing staff does. And it's, it is remarkable in your comments on mental health. Um, each and every evaluation when we get done, uh, the things that are observed, that's first and foremost uh, from the Leadership Beaverton participants is it is clearly uh, a mental health crisis inside your facility. So we'll hope that some of those capacity issues uh, can get discussed and help. But thank you for letting us have that experience. Thanks, Lori. Um, you bet. Um, land use policy and density requirements uh, that our uh, metropolitan government has put on our area have really resulted in, in a lot more crowdedness uh, and growing, as you talked about. Um, with increased density and urbanization, you tend to see increases in crime and some challenges with drugs, domestic violence, those kinds of things. Um, and right now we understand with COVID-19, uh, the shutdown requirements specifically on business is resulting in some increased property crimes. Um, we were on a, um, a town hall with Chief Groshong recently who shared with us that Beaverton is experiencing an uptick um, and that there's lots of citations that are being issued, uh, but they aren't being jailed right now. Um, as sheriff, uh, you might want to address that. And then as sheriff, what can we as citizens and businesses uh, be doing proactively uh, to be a part of the solution to reducing these activities? Thank you, Lorraine. That's a great question. So just last week, I was on a call with our Washington County electeds, mostly House, State House and Senate uh, electeds. And before the call, we reached out to our uh, police chief, my police chief colleagues to kind of get a sense for what was happening in their cities with respect to crime. Um, and while, you know, Beaverton was, was, was uh, wrestling with the, with the thefts and shoplifting at the, at the town square Fred Meyer and my heart goes out, out to them there at the Fred Meyer, you know, Twalton wasn't experiencing the same kinds of issues. Um, it was, it was interesting that city to city, it's not exactly the same, but nevertheless, there was, uh, there is uh, a challenge there at the Fred Meyer. And so what um, the wonderful team at the Beaverton Police Department did is work with their loss prevention officers to narrow the entrances and exits so they could keep a better eye on just what was happening at the store. I talked to Chief, Gro Chief Groshong last week about the challenge there. And what we, what we decided in concept was to uh, stand up an interim booking process. So while 
while we are, um, we have fewer adults in custody in the jail to prevent as much as we can from COVID-19 getting a foothold there, because we want to keep and preserve the function, that function, that's got to be, that's, that's important for us. We also have to do everything we can to work with our police department partners, our deputies in the field who are, who are um, making arrests. Uh, and when those arrests don't meet the threshold for that uh, lodging in our jail, we want to have a process that we still, you know, we still impact them in a way and, and hope to uh, uh, address the deterrent factor a little bit more effectively. So what our jail sergeants are doing are, is standing up an interim booking process in our Sally Port, which is where police officers park their cars. It's secure. We have a we have an office out there where we can stand up a interim booking process so that um, for those repeat offenders, right, who are not taking that citation and not uh, 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 doing the right thing, we have a, another way to, um, to, to slow them down, if you will, to add that deterrent factor until we can start peeling back the protective layers of the jail and go back to something that resembles normalcy. Um, we have some really smart uh, business owners around the county. I, I know that from talking to our crime prevention specialists who work with businesses. Um, certainly environmental design is important. You can do as a business owner uh, to make sure that you have, you know, solid doors and locks um, and making it challenging and difficult for somebody to, to break in if they're thinking about it. But signage is important as well. And cameras and signs that say something like, uh, you're being monitored right now. You know, you're on camera. We have lots of cameras. If you break in, an alarm will sound and police will be here quickly. And that is, that's true. Our response times in the city of Beaverton and, and outside the city, we're going to get there fast, especially today. Uh, so those are the kind of crime prevention strategies that, uh, you know, I would encourage business owners to employ. And if you get stuck or have a question, you know, the sheriff's office is happy to help uh, provide provide additional guidance. The Beaverton Police Department does a great job to, with that as well. Thanks, Pat. That's that's super helpful. I'm taking notes right now. I like the uh, the recommendation on signage. I think that's a really easy solution um, that we can take tomorrow. Um, as you know, Metro is proposing a 10 year billion dollar income tax to pay for um, homeless services. We talked a little bit about this um, when we met with you. But tell me a little bit about um, how, if that does pass, it's, by the way, it's polling, it looks like um, at 57%, as Lorraine mentioned. Um, I'm curious, tell me about how you would work to make sure those dollars stay in Washington County. Because um, as of right now, I think the bill's written, um, Multnomah County receives a lion's share of that, of those funds. Um, so I guess, is that fair? Or is there anything we can do to make sure we can get those funds staying in Washington County? So Washington County businesses and, um, and, and constituents aren't subsidizing Multnomah County's issues? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. I uh, think that the uh, that, that that cake is baked. Probably uh, the the um, the measure is is written and in and, and as it's written, I I wish that the the funds raised by our county would certainly stay in our county to serve our community. <clears throat> Same with Clackamas and Multnomah counties. That seems to me to be just from a uh, fairness standpoint, that seems to me to be the way to go, but it, but but that looks like it may not be the case. So, you know, I think from a from a sheriff's office, from a law enforcement standpoint, the way that we can help is to continue to outreach to those who are without a house, who are living outside, and make our very best efforts to connect connect them to housing. If the measure passes, as you know, it's going to increase services, right, to go with the housing. And certainly the idea is to transition folks into independence and, and not be not be without a house. So we can continue to do that on the outreach uh, side, just like we're doing now. Um, I would like to grow that uh, at the sheriff's office. Uh, we're doing that out of Hyde right now uh, and getting it done when and where we can. And as you probably know, there are a fair number of folks who are living outside who prefer to live outside and they lack trust in uh, service providers in, in us, for example. And so it takes it takes a bit of time to invest in folks through just visits and conversation to build that trust so that when they are ready to make that move to services to be rehoused that we have we have that relationship built and we have knowledge about the services that we can connect them to to give them the best chance of success. 
Thank you so much. Um, there's two other very, very important and I think dear to your heart and my heart measures uh, that are coming up on the May ballot, not just candidates. Uh, we have the here together, but uh, what I'm speaking of in particular is the Washington County Public Safety Levy and the Cooperative Library uh, Levy that uh, the Chamber is supporting both of those uh, issues. And I'm, I'm a little concerned, to, to be honest, uh, given our COVID-19 environment. Um, I happen to be in the area, I think it was um, early 2000s, Pat, where we did have a, a fail in the levy and we had to come back around to, re, to reinstitute it. Um, I don't want to see that happen again. Um, I think that levy is critical to our community, especially given our time. Um, what can you share with folks to really emphasize the vitalness of getting that passed? Well, you have a good memory, Lorraine. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, what the public safety, first of all, thank you to the Beaverton Chamber for supporting the Washington County Public Safety Levy and the library levy. Together, they are critical really for us to maintain a safe community, which is good for business. What the public safety local option levy provides, it, it ensures that our, our justice system components are best uh, mutually supportive. And so that when a Beaverton police officer makes an arrest, brings someone to jail, that we have a jail with enough beds to house that person or to at least get them to their uh, arraignment before a judge makes them swear that they will show up for court. Um, it ensures that if, in, for example, if there's a domestic violence charge or child abuse or child pornography, which those cases filed by the DA's office are on the rise. And that levy helps ensure that we have the capacity in the DA's office to prosecute those crimes, to hold people accountable, um, and to safeguard the victims who are impacted by those crimes. It helps ensure that our parole and probation office and those probation officers can keep up with increased caseloads, particularly in, in domestic violence crimes, and that our juvenile counselors, uh, that we have enough of them and those services to get our kiddos back on track if they start to go to go astray. We have a long track record of managing those funds, delivering those services in an important, in an effective and responsible manner. And I'll just share with you at the sheriff's office, for example, we recognize that the economics of public budgeting is important to voters. It's important to our community. And we, we, we spend what we need to make sure that our, our staff are well-trained, well-equipped, well-led, that we measure up to the standards through accreditation and inspections and other other checks and balances. But we return funds which we don't need. And in at the end of the last budget year, we returned about 6% from our three funds, which were unspent, totaling about $7 million to help the beginning fund balance of the following fiscal year. So being uh, responsible with public, uh, with, with tax dollars is really, really important to us and the other departments of the county. So we have a good track record of uh, being responsible with those with those tax dollars. We um, have seen in the past couple of years that both property crime and violent crime has begun to trend up. Um, and there's no more important time than now to continue those services. And in a few cases, those services are enhanced, enhanced in a manner that allows us to keep that jail fully staffed uh, so that the, the DA's office can keep up with increased prosecution of, of, of child abuse uh, and the other kinds of, of uh, challenges we face on the public safety side that I, that I just covered. So thank you for your support to the public safety levy. Super important to continue those services and then to make sure that they're balanced. So they're, they're supportive to uh, the cities like Beaverton and great agencies like the Beaverton Police Department. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Sounds Pat. like we got to pass that uh, public safety levy. Um, two part question for you. Uh, how do you how do you think um, the county's emergency response team these past few weeks has handled the COVID-19 crisis? Um, also, how many prisoners have you had to release because of distancing requirements? I know uh, Chief Groshong shared that any arrests in Beaverton right now uh, for nonviolent crimes are simply getting a violation, um, uh, just getting written up and released. Overall, how do you feel like that process is being managed currently? Uh, thank you, Mark. So my impression of the countywide emergency operations center is going, it's going well. 
Uh, they're getting good information out to our partners across the county, to our cities. Um, we're taking care to coordinate with cities. If, for example, there's a business where, where the center has received complaints that they may be working outside of, of uh, you know, the governor's um, uh, order or uh, social distancing, the, the center is working hard to coordinate with the cities to make sure that to the extent that we can, that we're not duplicating efforts and communicating with uh, with groups and uh, and and businesses in, in those cities. And we're doing it in a, in a measured and uh, uh, a way that provides education and collaboration and, and saving any kind of enforcement action to the very, very as a very, very last resort um, on the on the jail side and enforcement. So we began really early measuring the, or at least accounting for COVID-like symptoms where we may need to keep someone under observation. We started asking questions of arriving arrestees on February 6th, if they have COVID-like symptoms. And so that enabled us to help us so far, knock on wood, to keep COVID out of the jail. Given the community spread, I think it won't surprise us if we do get an infection inside that facility, but so far we've been able to keep, keep it out. What we did on March 16th, after a meeting with our justice system leaders, is that we began working to do releases of pre-sentenced folks in custody. So those are folks, uh, adults who are yet to be sentenced, uh, they balancing public health and public safety. We did make some releases coordinating with the court and the DA's office. And then for those, we, ma we made a few releases of folks who were nearing the end of their sentence. Maybe they had 10 days left or they were sentenced to two days in custody. We asked the court if we could just sentence them straight to probation. So that got us down to about 60% uh, um, full in our jail, which enabled us to have every inmate in their own cell to eat, sleep. We could uh, have out time in smaller groups so they can maintain distancing. That too has helped where we have our adults in custody under observation for symptoms. We have COVID tests that we've been able to administer and they've all come back negative so far. So, so far, so good. Now to slow the inflow of individuals in custody in the jail, we did, I did implement a threshold. It's, it's A and B felonies, person crimes, domestic violence, sex crimes. So you can commit like a burglary. If somebody breaks into your house and is caught, that's an A felony. It's not traditionally a person crime, but they're still going to go to jail. Uh, and that has that has helped us maintain right around half about about we're about half full in jail, and we're talking about peeling back those protections and getting back to normal, or some resemblancy of some semblancy of normal. We know we're probably going to have to maintain some capacity if we do get positive COVID uh, infections of, of a, the adults in custody. We're going to have to quarantine them in a housing unit that is that's probably the the way we're going to have to go so there may be some longer term consequences but we're just as i said earlier we have an interim booking process that we're standing up for those lower level offenses uh, and we're just managing day to day and keeping a close eye on recommendations from the cdc from the oregon health authority and from our own experts here at the county about how to kind of open our jail back up as we move along this current time we're in Thanks, Pat. Um, a kind of sidebar question, but along what you were just sharing, um, I received a, a kind of an urgent request from TBFNR earlier or late last week, I guess I should say, requesting um, PPE from any businesses that might have spares. Obviously, uh, your fine men and women that are on the front line, first responders, um, they, they must be facing that situation as well. Do, does the sheriff department um, have enough PPE to your satisfaction right now? Love the question. Right now, we're in pretty good shape. Okay. TVFNR, their burn good. rate of PPE is going to be higher than ours, right? Because they're showing up at uh, AED uh, uh, medical calls, and their their PPE requirements are a little a little bit higher than ours. We do have mm -hmm. the N95 masks for our patrol deputies. Um, we've had volunteers step up in a huge way to make cloth masks for both our our inmates, so we can protect you know our staff and inmates from them and our staff. Sure. We just got enough last week because we have to launder them at the end of the day. The CDC has been recommending mask wear. Our jail leadership team made it mandatory in jail last Thursday. So we are keeping up on that front. 
Um, but I appreciate the offer and we're working through our emergency operations center to both get volunteer masks and we're also ordering from some suppliers on the commercial side. Excellent. Good. Glad, glad to know you're, you're covered. Um, obviously this whole uh, visit, we've been talking about how things are just very, very different and our, our new normal uh, is, is going to be something we all don't quite know yet. Um, as you, this time of year is budgeting process because our governments work on fiscal year. Um, what do you see as the priorities, especially within the sheriff's budget, um, but you can address the county as well. Um, it's all kind of one and the same. Um, but what are you concerned about uh, in terms of budget and the jail budget uh, going into this next fiscal year? Well, Lorraine, about 80% of our budget funds personnel. Uh, the rest of the 20% is equipment, some training costs, some contracting through our dispatch center and some other service providers. So my uh, concern is uh, to keep the staff that we have in place and on the job so that they can continue to serve our community and, and, and keep everyone safe. And right now, as you might imagine, we are in the trenches as far as putting a budget request together and that has changed significantly in the past two months so our initial request has been cut cut significantly however what it, it is shipping up to be is a maintenance budget so we are very likely well right now we're keeping all our staff uh, back in 2010 2011 2012 we did have to hold vacancies on the enforcement side less so on the jail side I don't see that into the next fiscal year, but um, you know it, it's going to depend on how things play out over the next few months. So we're working hard to um, again just be really fiscally responsible. It's going to be more important into next year than it has been for a long time. Uh, our our travel is going to be down. You know our materials and supplies are going to be down. We're just going to be very very frugal and make decisions uh, in with that lens, that budget lens being first and foremost. So we can keep our men and women on the job doing the the hard work, the the, the dangerous work that they do sometimes for our community. Pat, got a question for you out of curiosity. Is your department enforcing social distancing laws at all, or is that something you'd foresee ever happening in this in our county in this in this country at all? Yeah. So, gosh, uh, Mark, great question. Where we view ourselves is to be public health ambassadors. So, right, so we're going to educate folks about social distancing, um, and that has that's worked in almost every case. I'll tell you one example where it hasn't worked terrific, and we've had a VRBO who has remarkably uh, been a venue for some parties and has driven their neighbors nuts. And so uh, we've visited that uh, that place uh, in a neighborhood um, the occupants there are short-term stays so we may issue a warning a few days later they're gone the following weekend there was a second event and I sent a uh, really I sent a threatening letter to the owner that we are going to take enforcement action the very next time we run into that problem in coordinating with our emergency operations center so that, that those rare occasions are going to pop up where we are going to have to take enforcement action but we're really doing it because it's a public health issue and it's dangerous to the neighbors it's driving them nuts and so we really need to respond in those cases cool thank you thank you for that uh let's say you are elected uh what do you want to be known for accomplishing in these next four years i want to i want to continue to increase our recruiting in numbers and diversity and so we're going to continue to focus uh diverse groups we're going to put those diverse staff we have to tell their story uh to share what it's like to do some of the most important work in the community that we could do um i want to uh continue to implement our body worn camera program uh, I want, I look forward to being a member of the county's uh, equity advisory council and to work with our equity advisory community uh, advisory council. Um, we want to certainly work through this COVID crisis so that we, as I have said before, become public health's new best friend, right? So we can protect our staff and support them in the best way we can so that they can support our community. And then I want to continue to work with just a wide array 
of partners and stakeholders, traditional stakeholders and partners like the Beaverton Police Department. We partner together on our interagency drug enforcement team, on our SWAT team, our negotiations team, our crash accident reconstruction team, um, the DA's office, of course, and then some partners which you might think are non-traditional. You know, I've been on the phone with the ACLU uh, and emailing the past several weeks to help leverage the Oregon State Hospital to accept our adults in custody who are unable to aid and assist in their own defense, get them to the Oregon State Hospital where, where they need to be for, for treatment, uh, for, uh, for counseling. Uh, the Disability Rights Oregon, another wonderful group that advocates for our mentally ill and particularly those in custody. Uh, we have a, a really solid partnership with them. I submitted a declaration in a, in a suit that they brought against the state of Oregon to expand their capacity to help those in custody with mental illness. Our great community-based organizations like Virginia Garcia, Adelante Mujeres, Centro Cultural, they, they provide great services that we want to coordinate with them. So it's just a wide array of stakeholders that we want to continue to work with because we've got to work together to provide the best partnerships and uh, services for our communities here in Washington County. Uh, Pat, um, I'm not going to ask you a date. I know that I think, um, generally speaking, um, all of us are feeling like the stay home, stay healthy order will probably be remaining in effect through May, especially in the metropolitan area. Um, but how, um, from, from what you're seeing, feeling, and being on the front lines of first responders and being intimately connected with the public health system, um, can you share what you'd what you'd like to see the beginning rollout look like for Washington County? Boy, that's uh, there's a that's a great question, one that everybody wants answered. There's a little bit of speculation no, in, in there uh, in my answer, but you know, I think it's going to be it's going to be iterative. What I heard probably one of the most famous people in the country right now, Dr. Fauci, say is we need to peel back the protections slowly. Uh, and I think for us, that is going to be true. I think the kind of protective equipment that we use into the future, in addition to a bulletproof vest and a vest and a belt, we're going to be we're going to have some other protective equipment that we're going to become accustomed to 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 using. I think we need to have rapid testing for our staff, rapid testing for our community. Uh, certainly, a public health capacity that can can track and trace in a very very timely way. While I see our budgets as a maintenance budget at the sheriff's office, our, our health departments are going to have to get more capacity to meet the needs to help us find our way through this and back to some degree of normalcy. I just think it's going to be slower than faster. And I heard a, a, a CDC official say, if it feels like we're overkill on protecting ourselves from COVID, it probably means we're getting it about right. So data time, we're starting to plan to work our way out of this from a sheriff's office standpoint so that we're ready when our health advisors say, you know, it's time to get moving. It's time to get something back to feeling more normal. Right, we're, uh, we're following the U.S. Chamber Path Forward plan um, and it's, it's happening over a series of different meetings and industries coming together. And I'll be working with the city of Beaverton's ec economic development team to kind of get build a a grassroots Beaverton reopening plan. Um, and I think it's important that uh, all of us work together uh, because the last thing any of us want to see is to be back where we are uh, a month from now, three months, six months from now. Um, but at the same time, we have to get back to business. We have to, we have to have community again. So finding, finding the right balance and doing those things. I appreciate you stepping out there with me on that question. Um, so now it's, I'm going to turn it back to you, Pat, anything we have missed that you want to share with our audience and, um, let us know. You know, Lorraine, uh, Mark, I just want to thank the chamber for their terrific work and for being nimble during this time and flexible with how we get, you know, your word out. We have important relationships with the Aloha business, uh, 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 the Aloha Chamber, the uh, Cedar Mill Chamber of Commerce, and uh, the Raleigh Hills Chamber. And those are just really important to continue to maintain in, into the future. Absolutely. Good deal. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Pat. Um, these uh, videos will remain on Facebook and YouTube. 
and uh, you'll probably see it build. All the other ones have crossed 400, 500 views. So uh, folks that may not be watching now will have that opportunity to see this down the road. And, and we certainly hope they all vote for you for Washington County Sheriff. Um, I want to thank Mark. Um, I, I forgot to say at the beginning of our interview, he is chair elect of our board of directors, and I'm so excited to have him uh, a part of that. And he's on our candidate endorsement council, business advocacy council, and just really engaged and understands the importance of the business voice uh, at all levels of government and, and community. So thanks, Mark. I appreciate you so much. Um, our next door knocking interview will be this Thursday at 530. We are going to meet with Roy Rogers, who is, a, I think, the longest standing county commissioner now on the, on the board. Uh, and he is up for another four year run. So we'll visit with him. But for now, thank you, Pat. We appreciate all that you do and, and all your men and women. Thank you for keeping our county safe. And I want to remind everybody to please vote for the Washington County Public Safety Levy and the Cooperative Library Levy. Just absolutely critical uh, to our communities going forward. So thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. See you guys.